If I have seen further than others, it is by standing upon the shoulders of giants. Truth is ever to be found in simplicity, and not in the multiplicity and confusion of things. To every action there is always opposed an equal reaction. To myself I am only a child playing on the beach, while vast oceans of truth lie undiscovered before me. I keep the subject of my inquiry constantly before me, and wait till the first dawning opens, gradually, by little and little, into a full and clear light. Mother, I am going to take you and Barnaby Smith, and I am going to wait until you are in your house. And then I'm going to lock you in your house. And then I'm going to take kindling and set that kindling aflame and set the house on fire. And I'm going to watch as you and Barnaby Smith burn alive. And I'm going to listen to your screams, your pitiful plaintive screams. And I'm going to take great pleasure as I listen to you suffer and finally meet your makers. Hello, 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 and welcome to this edition of The Jolly Heretic. Today I would like to talk about a certain very specific kind of person, and that is the genius. The nature of the genius. What kind of people are geniuses? What makes a person a genius? Now, uh, that was uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton, as many of you may know, is uh, in many ways an archetypal genius. The number of discoveries he made is uh, quite incredible, uh, but, but he was also not a very nice person at all. Um, he had a lot of people put to death when he was in charge of the Royal Mint for counterfeiting coins, and he once threatened to lock his mother and stepfather in their house and burn them to death. So these are the kind of people we're dealing with, geniuses. So what I want to look at today is what is the genius, what kind of people become genius, and in evolutionary terms, what is the point of the genius? Well, first of all, how do we identify a genius? Well, it's rather like how we identify everything, really. It's the wisdom of crowds. The way that we understand someone to be a genius is that they are acknowledged by lots of other people, in particular specialists in the field, to have made incredible and important contributions. Really revolutionary contributions, if we were to focus on scientific genius. Really revolutionary contributions to science. Really overwhelmingly important inventions. That's what makes someone a genius. That they've invented something, they've come up with something, they've solved some puzzle that's extremely important and that's recognised by other people to be extremely important. That's that's a genius. Now, what kind of people are these geniuses? Well, there's some very interesting research on this. Um, one of the um, factors, according to Hans Eysenck, who's done a lot of research into the nature of genius, is simply outlier high IQ. Well, the normal range of IQ is between 70 and 130. And so normally you would predict an outlier high IQ, a person beyond the normal range, to have an IQ of above 130 and even above 145. This is important. This puts them in a tiny percentage of the population. Uh, this is important because it means they're extremely intelligent and this allows them to come up with original, this gives them the ability to solve problems. This, this is what the essence of intelligence is solving cognitive problems, and this gives them the ability to solve cognitive problems, or in the case of the artistic genius or the military genius, other kinds of geniuses, to be very, very good at, at solving a, a problem in a narrow way and therefore doing something highly original. The second is the nature of the personality of the genius. Um, two key factors here. The first is that they tend to be. Whereas, let's say, scientists, for example, and, and indeed academics in general, um, and indeed successful people in general, tend to be high in what we call conscientiousness. This is a personality factor which refers to impulse control, rule following, and therefore being diligent and organised and hard working. Conscientiousness. These people, tend, this is predicts being a scientist, it predicts being a, a, involved in any, any profession at all. You're, you're high in this. These people are moderately low in this. Now, this is in terms of being successful in life, this is compensated for by their very, very high intelligence, of course, but they are moderately low in conscientiousness, moderately low in impulse control. Now, what this means is they are not rule following, um, they, they are not bound by rules, and this makes them creative. It allows them to think outside the box, it allows them to see things in a kind of unusual, uh, sort of artistic way. And indeed, often if you compare scientists and artists, arty types, arty types are lower in conscientiousness than science types. It was, it was found by his son, Charles Darwin's desk, his office was just chaos, it was like a bomb had hit it. Um, this would be consistent with him being low in conscientiousness. Um, 
the behaviour of, 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 of Isaac Newton there could possibly indicate low conscientiousness. Uh, and the second thing, and this is clearly obvious with Isaac Newton, is low agreeableness. They're not very nice people. Agreeableness is a personality trait which is defined by altruism, that is that you, you want to help other people, you're a kind person, and empathy, that is that you you feel the feelings of other people, you empathise with them. Now, if these people, these genius types, are low in uh, empathy, they either don't care about the feelings of other people, or they're a bit autistic, really, and they couldn't identify those feelings even if they did care. This means, because new ideas, new radical breakthrough ideas of the kind that geniuses engage in, will always offend people. They will always offend against vested interests. But, of course, if you don't care about that, or you don't realise it's going to happen, then you will be able to, you will A, have the brilliance and the low conscientiousness to come up with your idea, and B, you will be happy to present it because you won't care about the consequences of offending people. Um, neuroticism, this is another psychological trait, it refers to mental instability. Uh, this seems to vary uh, according to the kind of genius that we're talking about. So we'll look at this in a bit later. But in general, scientific geniuses do not seem to be particularly high in neuroticism. Neuroticism is associated with being an artistic genius, i.e. you feel negative feelings strongly. This is what neuroticism is. Um, so things like depression and anxiety and whatever. And it seems that Art becomes a kind of therapy for people that have these these traits, and also it it, it acts as a motivator. It 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 means that they kind of um, that the world is so horrible to them that they want to kind of present it and make the world better, um, and, and 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 things like this. So neuroticism varies. In general, these kinds of traits, low agreeableness and low conscientiousness, are, are, are part of what we call a fast life history strategy. We are all on a spectrum of how we live our lives between fast, i.e. you live fast, die young, invest lots of your energy in sex, and not particularly interested in nurturing children. That's a fast life history strategy. Live fast, die young, adapted to an unstable ecology which could be wiped out in any minute. To a slow life history strategy, live slow, die old, adapted to a stable ecology, the stable in which you want, you, this is highly predictable, you're not going to die out any minute, it's highly predictable, therefore you're in competition against other people uh, and you can predict how that competition will work and therefore, um, you, you because you can predict the future, it means that if you're high in conscientiousness you'll make better predictions about the future, you'll follow those predictions through and you'll be more likely to survive. And so they're all we're all on this extreme from fast to slow. So what we seem to have, to some extent, with these geniuses is very highly intelligent, fast life history be strategists. Now, this is an extremely unusual combination to get because, in general, uh, 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 groups of people who are slow life history strategists are also high um, in intelligence, and people that are fast life history strategists are low in intelligence. So, it's very rare to have a highly intelligent, fast life history strategist. But this seems to be the essence of the genius. He is a highly intelligent, fast life history strategist. Now, there may be evolutionary reasons for that, but I'll look at those in a minute. But before, before we do that, what kind of people become geniuses? Who are these geniuses? Well, the first thing that seems to be true of them is that they move, is that you can, you can look at different sciences and different academic subjects in terms of how, basically how difficult they are. What is the IQ level involved in that subject? In general, people that do things like physics are more intelligent than people that do chemistry. People that do chemistry are more intelligent than people that do biology. People that do biology are more intelligent than those that do social sciences and whatever. And people that do social sciences are more intelligent, in general, there's exceptions, than those that do humanities subjects. So you, you could talk about higher domain subjects, i.e. more intelligent subjects, and lower domain subjects. What generally happens with geniuses is that they are educated in a higher domain, let's say physics, and they make a contribution to a lower domain, let's say chemistry. An extreme example of this would be someone like Bronislaw Malinowski, who is the Polish anthropologist, normally understood as the founder of modern anthropology, the founder of the idea that what anthropologists should do is they should live with the tribe and learn their language and learn all about them. Well, he was a physicist, and then he moved into cultural anthropology, which he probably is one of the least intellectual, least academic uh, subjects that you can, you can possibly think of in academia in terms of the, the uh, intelligence of people that do it. So that would be an extreme example of that. They move from a higher domain to a lower domain, and they make their contribution in the lower domain. The second thing is that the more sciencey the, the genius is, the more sciencey the subject is, the less mentally ill made geniuses tend to be. This is from research by somebody called Dean K. Simonton, in which he looked at different people who are regarded as highly creative scientists, because that's what a genius is, really. A highly creative scientist, a highly creative artist, a highly creative 
investigative journalist or writer or whatever. And he compared these different people. The more sciencey the, the area is, the less mentally unstable they are. So uh, the, more, the, the, the physics genius is going to be uh, the most mentally stable. And as you move down to the geniuses in the worlds of, of, of the lower sciences, in the worlds of the social sciences, in the worlds of the humanities and so on, uh, then they become more mentally unstable. Equally, highly creative and successful writers of non-fiction tend to be more st mentally stable than highly successful and creative writers of fiction. The next thing you can look at, and this fits somewhat with, uh, because with agreeableness and conscientiousness, is, the psycho is being psychopathic, psychopathology. To a certain extent, psychopathology is a combination of low, it's a simplification, but it's a, complication, it's a combination of low agreeableness and low conscientiousness. Now, what you find is that within science, those that are understood to be psychopathic, to have severe psychopathic traits, that makes up 18% of people who are highly creative and successful scientists. Um, as against 38% of people who are highly successful and highly creative writers. So this is showing you that psychopathology is higher among those who are, as it were, literary geniuses or, sci or geniuses that are less scientific than those that are more scientific. So there's something about, so that they become lower in agreeableness and lower in conscientiousness. And this makes sense, of course, because if the essence of creativity seems to be agreeableness and conscientiousness, then the very, very creative person, the person who's simply utterly creative would be someone like the artist. And indeed, this works. As you move down, even through the arts themselves, you find that the writer of a novelist, a novelist is less mentally is less mentally unstable and less psychopathic than a poet and a poet is less mentally unstable and less psychopathic than an artist so these there is the differences in psychopathology uh, in madness basically uh, among these geniuses then there is also um, an hereditary element to it so among though this is interesting as well so among people who are a creative, highly creative physicists, 28% of them have a father who is a physicist, of this sample, have a father who is a physicist or a scientist or something like that. Um, and, but as you move down into the arts, it's only, it's it's a very small percentage. It's only, um, you know, it's, 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 very, it's, very, very, it's very, very few. 2% among physicists, 11% among um, chemists, and 17% among writers. So you can see um, that the, the, the the, the, the way this is uh, operating. Now, in terms of writers, um, very interesting point here, the, uh, the influence of the childhood, um, the childhood tends to be more unpleasant the more creative that you are. Uh, so, among writers, 30% uh, of major important writers uh, in this sample experienced death or desertion or bankruptcy of a pair of a father or impoverishment uh, when they were a child. Among physicists, it was basically none. So what this mean, what this is showing you is that a, a, a childhood like that, a childhood in which the, in, in which your father dies or your father's bankrupted or you're deserted or you're extremely poor, that is going to set you up for a fast life history strategy. And the fast life history strategy, when combined with high intelligence, is going to make you highly creative. So so that's a clear difference. The people who are the, the more artistic sort of people are those people that have an unhappy childhood, basically an unstable childhood, and this will seem to make them more creative, essentially more artistic. And and those that, are, that, that, that have had a happy childhood, they are less artistic and so they go into something else like science or whatever. So it's a, it's a, a, a very um, interesting point here. Sorry, I messed up something earlier. It was 2% of physics, uh, um, people that were physics, uh, creative physicists had lost a father. 11% of chemists lost a father as a child and 17% of writers. And the heredity was that being, being a, a, a scientist was highly heritable and being something like an artist is very, very unheritable. Now, this is a, a very interesting point, of course, because it, it, what it implies is that it's, it's the creation of an unstable environment. So intelligence, physics, it's, it's that that does it. And that's not, a, that's not something that's hereditary necessarily, or particularly hereditary, having an unstable child environment. So it's showing you that to be very, very creative, a uh, very creative genius, a very creative artistic genius, what you need is an unstable childhood environment. To be a very, very creative physicist, a very big part of it is obviously going to be your intelligence, and that is 0.8 heritable, and therefore, um, therefore the heritability of, of being a, a physicist, as it were, is going to be higher, because it's much more to do with intelligence. Whereas intelligence is much less important 
as you as you as as an artist or whatever, although they can be highly intelligent, it's less important because intelligence when it goes down as you move down the domains from physics into the arts. So therefore, intelligence is less important. The her the heritable issue is less important, and what becomes more important is the non-heritable issues, i.e., the very unstable environment that sets you up as a fast life history strategist and makes you highly creative. So this is a very important point about them as well. Now these um, um instability markers go on into adulthood. So the divorce rate among uh, people who are uh, these creative scientists is relatively high. They have bad relationships with their partners. The divorce rate among highly creative eminent social scientists is about 41%. The divorce, however, the divorce rate among eminent biologists and whatever is only 15%. So this is interesting. This is, that's lower than the, than the, the population average of the, when the data was taken. So this is showing you that these creative types, these artistic types, highly unstable environment, therefore they don't create strong bonds, therefore they divorce. The R strategist does not create strong bonds. He invests in sex and he doesn't, he, he tends therefore to have weak social bonds and to get divorced. The K strategist, the slow life history strategist, invests his energy in other things, invests his energy in um, strong bonds and nurturing, including nurturing his partners, and doesn't get divorced. There's also some evidence that later borns are more likely to be highly creative uh, scientists and whatever than firstborns. Uh, why would this be? Well, one, it's unclear why, but one possibility could be that there is autism. It seems to be autism is that you are basically low empathy. Uh, and low empathy is an important dimension of being a highly creative uh, scientist or highly creative uh, writer or whatever. So it could be that autism is the factor because paternal age predicts autism. The older your father is, the more mutant sperm, the more likely is your father's sperm to be mutated. The more likely his sperm has been mutated, the more likely the child, particularly the son, is to be autistic. The more likely he is to be autistic, if he's highly intelligent, then the more likely he is to be a kind of a creative genius type because they tend to be high in autism and high in intelligence. So that could explain that. So these are the key dimensions of the genius then. You have this fast life history, low agreeable, low conscientious personality. Uh, that seems to predict it, uh, which is partly heritable. Intelligence is about uh, 0.8 heritable, member and uh, personality about 0.5 heritable. And then you have this unstable ecology, which also makes you a kind of a fast life history strategist. And these two things seem to go together to make you highly creative. So that's the genius. Now, where does the genius come from? You would expect that the genius would have been selected out under harsh Darwinian conditions. You would expect these are not very nice people. These are going to be antisocial people, antisocial, unpleasant people who would be killed by the band. So um, why, why do they exist? Surely they should simply have been killed. Uh, not only that, but the flip side of these people existing, these highly intelligent antisocial people, is going to be people who are of low intelligence but are highly antisocial. And these people are going to be criminals. That's what, that, that's what low IQ people who have those personality traits, psychopathic personalities are, they're criminals. So there's a degree to which the genius is a kind of high IQ criminal. So how could the genius possibly have stayed in the population? Well, the answer is what we call group selection. So there are a number of ways that you can pass on your genes. The first is individual selection. This is that you have children and you, you pass on your genes directly by having children. The second is what you call kin selection. This is that you, you, know, you have 25% of your genes in common, let's say, with your an aunt and a, ne and a nephew have 25% of their genes in common. And so therefore, an, as the spinster aunt who can't have children or doesn't have children will spoil will spoil rotten, will invest in their nieces and nephews because although they're not her children, they're 25% the same as her. So it's a way of indirectly passing on your genes. The third way of passing on your genes is what we might call extended kin selection or group selection. Um, and this is that you, you invest not just in your kinship group, in your family, but in your group, in your ethnic group. And this is an extended kinship group because it's been shown by research by Frank Salter that what these ethnic groups are, these different ethnic groups, English people, French people, whatever, are extended kinship groups. They are related. They are a, they are a kinship group. The average English person will have more genetically in common with, with another average random English person than he will with the average random French person because they are related more recently. So two average English people will, will share uh, a, a relative in the 1600s, something like that. Two average Finnish people might share a relative in, in the 1700s or even the 1800s. And so they're related and so in terms of passing on your genes, it makes sense to invest in the group and to do things for the group. And this is where 
military behavior comes from you laying down your life for your group ultimately or by laying down your life for your group in a situation where that group might be destroyed by another group you are helping to indirectly pass on your genes so that's group selection it's a way of indirectly passing on your genes now what do geniuses do well, it can be argued that what geniuses do, even though they don't, they, they might be horrible people and they might have no overt interest whatsoever in helping either their kin or their group. But what they do, people like Sir Isaac Newton, is they come up with amazing inventions and brilliant new things. And this, from their ideas, from their better understanding of the world, a group can develop better weapons. It can it can perform better in warfare. It can it can it can do all this kind of thing that helps it in the battle of group selection. We can conceive of a battle of group selection between different ethnic groups. And what the genius does is he invents this stuff, um, comes up with these new ideas, and it's going to it's going to help his group to win the battle of group selection and thus expand around the world um, and dominate other groups in the battle for the group to pass on its genes. And you can see this with scientists and their inventions and so on and their contributions to truth. You can see this with artists perhaps and religious figures in the way that they kind of inspire the group to to be more religious or, or something like that and interestingly um in computer models it has been shown that the all else controlled for the group that is highest in positive ethnocentrism i.e internal cooperation uh, and negative ethnocentrism i.e violently repelling the outsider that group will dominate the other group in in computer models that group will come to triumph in computer models uh, and religiousness has been shown to very strongly traditional religiousness has been shown to very strongly correlate with ethnocentrism indeed to genetically correlate with it so if the artist is promoting religiousness and making the group feel inspired then that's going to inspire the group and help it to expand similarly with the writer whatever so these people are operating at the group level and so therefore you would expect them there would be a benefit for, for these people to stay for the possibility of these people, i.e. the unlikely genetic combination of outlier high IQ plus these moderately psychopathic traits. There would be these antisocial traits. There would be a benefit for it to stay in the population. The group that maintained the optimum small level, optimum small level of people like this would dominate other groups and would win in the battle of group selection. Too many of people like this and the society will simply fall apart with infighting and nobody will be able to get on and it'll be terrible and the, and the group will be selected against. Too few of people like this and the society will be, will not be able to come up with new inventions it will it will be not an original society it will not be a creative society and it will be dominated by other societies an example of this will perhaps will be a society like japan it, we myself and my japanese colleague ken yakura and my dutch colleague jan tenishenhaus have done research on this and we've shown that the per capita level of genius in east asian countries is low and they seem to be low in gene forms that are associated with curiosity and whatever now why is that well it's because it's a very cold and difficult ecology which selects very strongly for agreeableness and very strongly for conscientiousness and conformity and 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 all that kind of thing because it's a very difficult ecology and the conditions are so harsh it's so cold in pre in prehistory uh, that the gene pool is very small and so consequently you don't get many outliers you don't get outliers what the genius is is an outlier he's an outlier in terms of intelligence he's an outlier in terms of the possibility of that outlier intelligence combining with moderately psychopathic personality but an ecology like that could not tolerate the flip side of of, of this gene Genius, which would be these psychopathic people undermining the system where everyone needs to cooperate um, and it could not uh, permit sufficient diversity to have these outliers in intelligence because that would mean the society would, would have would have problems as a consequence of that as well uh, it needs to have a small gene pool in order to survive the rigors of darwinian conditions and so consequently japan doesn't produce many geniuses and in terms of even though it has a higher iq than europe 105 iq compared to 100 for europe its per capita nobel prize science nobel prize achievement is much much lower than that of europe and it's because it doesn't have these geniuses because the flip side of the genius is the high IQ criminal or is the low IQ criminal and these people will mean that in the group selection that goes on in those ecologies it will just be the, the flip side will be so bad with uncooperative people that a more ethnocentric group will dominate them and they won't win so there seems to be this goldilocks zone where where we're able to have a sufficiently large gene pool to be able to produce these geniuses we're able to have a sufficient large gene pool to get outlier high iq we were able to be sufficiently as it were low in conscientiousness and low in agreeableness and for these traits to stay in the population and not cause our population to be destroyed and this allows us to operate this genius strategy 
Um, and so this is how genius has stayed in the population. And interestingly, a lot of geniuses, Isaac Newton is an example of this, tend to be asexual, which only goes to show that they operate at the group level. They don't tend to have children. They don't tend to get married. They tend to be quite sort of cold people that aren't interested in relationships, whether with people of the same sex or people of another sex. They are asexual. So that, again, shows you that they're passing on their genes at the group level. So that's geniuses. Now, what, what seems to be happening, of course, now, and I look at this in, with my colleague Bruce Charlton, our book, The Genius Famine, is there are fewer and fewer per capita geniuses. A, because we're becoming less intelligent, as I've looked at elsewhere, but B, because there, remember what these geniuses are, people like James Watson, high IQ plus poor social skills. And we used to have a situation where we would tolerate these people and we'd just say to them, OK, here's your place working at Oxford University or Cambridge University. Go away and do your genius work and let's hope you come up with something. We used to, That was what they used to get. So they, they, are, they are childlike people in a lot of ways. They're not very good at practical things because remember that the as you become more intelligent, then the positive relationship between the different components of intelligence becomes weaker. And as a consequence, you get the Sheldon Cooper type who is brilliantly intelligent, but he can't do practical, ordinary things. So they need to be kind of looked after and tolerated. And increasingly, universities don't do that. They are, they are dominated by political correctness, where everything's about feelings and not offending people. Well, the genius is useless at that. They're dominated by, they offend people. They just tell the truth. That's what they do. They tell the truth. They tell the truth. It's the truth. It's the truth. It's the truth. That's what they, they don't have the agreeableness to understand. That you can't do, you're not supposed to do that. So that's a problem. Um, secondly, increasingly, universities are becoming more and more bureaucratic which creates more and more bureaucracy. And so you have to do a certain number of papers every four years and you have to go to conferences and things like that. Geniuses hate doing things like that. And it militates in favour of short-term planning and short-term goals and incrementalism where you do little steps at a time. Geniuses aren't like that. They don't do little steps. They do breakthroughs. They do revolutions. They work on the same problem for 10 years and do nothing other than that for 10 years and, 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 and solve the problem. They're like Michael Ventris. They spend years and years, I mean, how long was it? 20 years more on a Linear B and then finally crack it. They don't, they're not incrementalists. So our modern society is making it more and more difficult for geniuses, which is a problem because it is geniuses that produce these brilliant things which allow groups to survive and which allow breakthroughs to be made. So we need to do more to encourage genius. Well, I hope this has been of interest, and if it has, then please remember that YouTube is an anti-freedom, anti-genius organisation, and it is crushing this channel. We know I no longer get advertising on here. Um, I'm no longer on PayPal. Uh, so please, can you, uh, if you enjoy this stuff, then please feel free to donate to me uh, through the offline super chat thing, which I, you will see below. You can donate money through there. Uh, that's very important. Um, also through Subscribestar and PayPal. And I will see you soon. And goodbye. <laughs>